Hello and welcome to this session on a topic and a theme which is uh, very vibrant and important not just for India but perhaps for most emerging economies across the world. I am Pranjal Sharma. Uh, the discussion is going to be about how much of self-reliance should a country have and what should be the engagement with the world. How much is too much uh, on the other side and how do you ensure that the right balance is achieved in each of the uh, sectors uh, from defense to manufacturing to uh, pharmaceuticals to healthcare and i think this is a debate which is which is capturing the imagination of business leaders policy makers across the world uh, especially as we know that the the economic gravity uh, center of gravity of the world is uh, shifting to to asia and i think uh, from that perspective all the panelists here uh, have a lot of uh, value to add in their thoughts and their experience uh, let me uh, invite uh, uh, Prime Minister Ranil Vikram Singhe to, to begin and share his thoughts on uh, what is the right way to look at self-sufficiency. Uh, Prime Minister, over to you. Okay. Well, your term Atmaribha Bharat can mean so many things if you read, read the Prime Minister's speech. It's where exactly you want to go as the power shifts to Asia. So firstly, you've got to determine what is the global role for India. Secondly, how quickly can you take people out of poverty? It took China about 30 years to take 800 million out of poverty. I think these are the factors that should uh, guide the uh, discussion. Because uh, India has to remember that in today's world, economics is power. China came up not by developing its army, but developing its economy. Soviet Union developed its uh, army, it didn't develop its economy. So it went down. That has become the name of the game. So how, how, how are you going up? Now you look at uh, India here. For US or China to put in a aircraft carrier is not very much a problem as far as the budget is concerned. But in India there has to be a debate because resources are constrained. So the larger you go, the more you can accommodate both guns and butter. Otherwise you've got to fight between guns and butter. Then, uh, how does the Indian uh, business community to look at it? That's, I think I'll leave it to you all. But on the World Economic uh, Forum 2020 uh, uh, survey on open to the global market, in India, 22% were very, very positive, 53% were neutral, 23% were negative. In China, 81% were positive, 11% uh, neutral, and 2% negative. So I think the first issue we have to face is the mindset. How, how are you going to do it? And I thought I'll just introduce that theme and leave it for you all to take it forward. Thank you. I think that's that's an important point and how long it takes because, but you have to start somewhere and then have a set of consistent policies in a certain direction. Uh, Datuk, you know, would, would you like to come in here and share your thoughts on especially your experience and what's happened in Malaysia? Yeah, I mean, it's 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 always a balance uh, in these things. There's no question that we always, uh, in each country, look at our own, uh, in, especially in emergency situations like this. But this pandemic has clearly shown that the world needs to collaborate. Otherwise, there are no solutions. So while um, India, Malaysia, all countries are, are looking at ways of ensuring employment, ensuring growth within their own countries protected, there is sometimes a tendency in these situations to go too far. Uh, and that's damaging. And that balance is what's important. And, and uh, what policymakers must do is play chess, not checkers. Um, you know, it's not about the immediate gain. It's that whole board, because that's what keeps things going. You know, India is a godfather to, to all of us, to many of us. We look to India. We see India as one of the most important markets uh, now and in the future. Uh, we have two big giants, India and China. One is a democracy, one is not. Um, and uh, as, as we go forward, I've always believed uh, India is by far the most critical market for us, uh, for a country like Malaysia. Now, let me give you an example of our company, uh, company one of our companies, uh, Green Rubber. We manufacture our equipment in China. Our R&D and our scientists are India, India-based. Our tech labs are India-based. And our main manufacturing operations is, is Malaysia. Uh, and that's how we operate. Now, the next step for us is then to grow and get another manufacturing uh, base out of India, perhaps. But that's the growth growth. India should not prevent that. India should not create policies that might then deter companies like small companies like ours that are trying to grow and grow into the Indian market and other markets to move elsewhere. 
um, because when we come there, we hire Indians. We we are we're working with Indian scientists, collaborate uh, with Indian technologies, and in the same sense, they get our technology back to them. And I think you know, global innovation is so critical in where the world is going, uh, and we have to be careful that a powerhouse like India and the market it represents for the world uh, doesn't become insular and closed. And that that is that fine line, that dangerous line that any uh, government, any policymaker has to, to be careful about. That's, that's, that's uh, very critical because that's exactly the balance that uh, uh, Excellency also talked about, uh, that when do we have the right balance and collaborative approach. And I think what's important is there's a growing realization that emerging economies have to work with themselves together, within themselves as well. And, and you know, your example of, of the rubber company is fantastic because way you are collaborating within the region is is uh, perhaps the path ahead for for a lot of us uh, mukundan in in your experience uh, uh, where are we you you have been uh, you work very closely with indian policy makers you lead uh, uh, business uh, industry associations as well uh, and you are in, you know of course apart from running your company uh, how do you see the evolving uh, debate and the realities around uh, self reliance and atmanirbharta uh, th- uh, thank you, Pranj. I'm going to move forward from where uh, His Excellency, uh, Prime Minister, sort of highlighted the first point. I think uh, for us in Asia, we have to realize that we are caught up in a geopolitic today. I think that's a geopolitic which will remain for a long time of a, a past projecting power withdrawing, which is U.S. And again, again, I think the current emerging projecting power, which is China, I think we've got to live with two realities. Uh, whatever equations we put, I think... Uh, uh, rise of India, rise of ASEAN, all these things will happen, but in the shadow of these two geopolitics. And each government will have to navigate in its its own best interest what it needs to do. But I fully agree with you, agree with what has been said, that uh, cooperation is the way forward on that geopolitical umbrella. Then you layer this with uh, two, three forces which we are facing. One is sustainability, which is decarbonizing the world. Also talking about uplifting the poor, which uh, Prime Minister spoke about. And lastly, about the digital revolution. I think these are three forces which we need to sort of keep in mind as we evolve for future. But the way I look at this whole uh, concept is India, if you look at it from Indian perspective, India certainly needs to be part of the global supply chain. We cannot be isolated from global supply chain. I am a firm believer that going forward, global supply chains will play a big role uh, for corporations, Geographical boundaries are boundaries. You know, we will adhere to the local laws. We'll adhere to, but I think we will put our units where it's most competitive. Put up the unit. The second issue is India is forever going to be needing uh, capital. We will be capital start country. We need investment. So whatever policy we put together, we, we need to be welcoming investors, both domestic and international. We need to be very competitive to play a part in the global supply chain because if you're not plugged into the global supply chain, we cannot uh, win. And uh, these two are, I think, overriding uh, uh, principles with which you then layer what you call skilling people, getting jobs and all those issues. But I, w- I, would, I would certainly say that these are two big issues. And then when you say oscillating between self-reliance and globalization, I think these are part of the same puzzle. The only way to survive in this world going forward is uh, bringing down cost of doing business and increasing the ease of doing business. If these two parameters are focused by all governments, I think uh, we would then have a, a right way to move forward. I'll stop here, then we can have the conversation. Thank you. You mentioned uh, global value chains, uh, Mukundan, and I, th- I think on the points of ease of doing business is something which is almost like a given that it, it there, there is not a lot to negotiate that we need to improve the ease of doing business across uh, geographies, across economies in the region. But the question uh, is about uh, value chains and, you know, they have in the last few years, perhaps decades, a lot of imbalances crept in in the global value chain. Right? Yeah. And some of that rebalancing is happening in a post-COVID world where the reliance on China for manufacturing for the world clearly was misplaced. I mean, it looked terrific at one point, but perhaps it's not worked out equally well for everybody. I mean, in, in India, it's a popular example. Uh, perhaps Datuk and Prime Minister would, would know about it as well. But the fact that when we look at pharmaceutical sector, the fact that 90, 80 to 90% of the ingredients for basic pharmaceuticals uh, are sourced from China and India doesn't have its own capabilities. It doesn't bode well for anybody in the region. So, Prime Minister, my question to you is really about this, and I'll request Datuk also to chime in on this. 
how do we see the rebalancing of the value chain is that kind of dependence good how do we reduce dependence and create other capabilities domestic capabilities we cannot surely depend on just one country for 90% of needs for for example pharmaceuticals well you have to look at the trading arrangements of the world for 2050 and beyond we find one a single market in europe the realization that europeans are in retreat so they must need a large market <laughs> but now you are finding a bigger market coming in in asia the rcep the trading agreement basically with that comes also the second one the comprehensive progressive trans pacific partnership so you, what you find is that china and japan are now become the focal points of trading of uh, economic activity in asia uh, because the uh, comprehensive progressive tpp takes you on to north america minus usa uh, then you got the north uh, the north american uh, trade uh, agreements and you have us uk joining the uh, tpp so you get a one block in europe you get from uk onwards the tpp in the middle you get the trans pacific some stage us will come into that and then you get rcep so what has happened india is out of that now how are you going to develop just take one example for value chains take bimstek the only functioning organization if rcep develops bimstek will be of two levels there will be two countries in that so if, if you want your value chain to develop you must join that i know there have been a big debate in india on rcep but how can you develop your value chain because the only country that has a market big enough to create the conditions like china is uh, india but if india stays out then you can't do this you, you india must get into it there must be arrangements and you having another ma- big market from bangladesh all the way up to iran with pakistan india the uh, population will increase by about another 500 million but to create the value chain you must be inside the system and you must compete with the value chain that is on that, that i think that's one issue secondly is, uh, for me i look at the knowledge economy india which produce so many religions i think and uh, mathematician the zero is in a position to get on to the knowledge economy but that also requires you to break into that larger market so this is this is uh, for me uh, the india uh, all issues of india as mukundan said uh, value chain all depends on finding a large trading area so where are you going to find it others have created it whatever the debate is find you let go that dato would you like to uh... yeah, you know, i i agree i agree um um i'm not an expert in policies or global trade uh, organizations but there's no question uh, india cannot stay out uh, from a selfish perspective uh, india must not stay out for us yeah uh, we cannot be reliant on one giant uh, we cannot allow china to be the only giant in our in our neighborhood india is there but unless india is involved unless india is participating then you know we are left with only one big boy uh, and not the other uh and so and for india's sake uh, you know uh, india for the future again going back to China, has to be involved we cannot like uh, india cannot make decisions now that are very short sighted um whether it's tata chemicals or any other company as it looks uh, to global roll out as it looks uh, towards expanding its uh, activities and its uh, its market share uh, it must in- have india's involvement in some form of uh, global trade act um and we want india to have that because then you at least have a balance otherwise you have a very big uh, you know hammer on one side and no balance on the other uh, if you like and you know small countries like us <laughs> like to know that there are there are the, the big boys are being checked at least uh, so we need india therefore for that simple reason so i agree completely with uh, his excellency um india cannot stay out uh, and india is an example for us that can be about sustainable wealth creation right that's that's the key right that is what india wants okay you you're your unique country you have a significant size of middle class and and disposable wealth but at the same time you have an atrocious size of of hardcore poverty um so that gap that growth is possible and india with its abilities can create that sustainable uh, process to grow its economy but only if it involves global innovation uh and involves 
been part of of uh, the world uh, the world system so mukund this point on uh, engaging with global uh, trading uh, arrangements uh, do you think india needs to do more uh, wh- what are the issues because india has also felt sometimes that some of these arrangements have not benefited the country so i think uh, that's that's one one side to look at it when you look at for example our free trade agreement with korea japan have they benefited the country in trading terms i think if you add the investment term pranjal i think we missed the point how much of investment has come from korea how much of investment has come from japan are the japanese companies operating in india i think you got to look at both i think the, 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 these uh, comprehensive uh, agreements are not just about uh, goods being traded across border it is about investment coming in uh, making if you look at the entire indian automotive industry which is now prided as you know one of the world class benchmark it all started with a japanese small japanese investment and we can't run away from that fact so i think the fact is that we need access to investment we need access to technology and we need to be part of this and i think uh, approaching this with a sense of diffidence is not helping anyone i i certainly think well, you must negotiate you must negotiate your terms but you look at rcep it gives you a 30 year window on many items you don't have to comply with many things for it it's a long long window unlike uh, tpp which is a much shorter window so to 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 that extent i think uh, there are differing views certainly some sectors are more impacted but let me also tell you the sectors for example dairy sector which was getting uh, you know which which was feeling the pressure because of uh, new zealand exports uh, if you look at the indian cooperative movement i think it's a complete different model today dairy sector which i think is not a, a possible in any other country and we've done a great job in building a cooperative movement and cost competitive dairy sector within india and i think we must approach this uh, with 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 that confidence secondly i think there are internal uh, internal inefficiencies which need to get tackled when i say internal inefficiencies i think for example the new labor codes they are, they are tackling one big internal inefficiency the second big internal inefficiency is logistics but if you look at the way the rollout is happening of inter- the ra- quadrilateral railways the corridors the uh, you know the national road network i think those logistic issues are getting fast getting sorted out the the last thing comes to our, our power sector if you look at our power sector the the ever problematic state electricity board at the distribution level has to be solved once and for all it is not at the generating level where there's a problem but at the distribution level so we know what the cost factor cost which india is uncompetitive we need to address them coming to what datuk said very clearly we have a situation where i think indian entrepreneurs are very competitive very competent and we are willing to engage with the world with confidence and i can give an example of our own company we have operations in uk we have operation our, our one of our largest operations in us and we are, we are extremely happy with the way uh, the relationship has worked out and those operations work out. so uh, really i think uh, it is for us to look at uh, uh, two broad parameters that uh, we need to be competitive we need to improve ease of doing business reduce cost of doing business at the same time plug into the global supply chain and also fundamentally use the new technologies you know sustainability is going to be a big big issue we are low carbon economy even today there is no need to build now coal fired power plants going forward you build your solar power plants i think there's a complete new energy network which can come similarly i think we can build a complete new digital economy if you look at the way we built upi we built aadhar that entire fintech revolution which india has done we are way ahead of many many advanced countries in terms of access to uh, finance access to financial data if you look at our tax filing system very simple thing this is run by government our tax filing system today is simpler than the U- united states tax filing system it is actually far more efficient so we can build stuff which is more efficient but we need to look at the new discontinuities which is in the form of sustainability and digital and ride the wave with confidence and work and engage with the world not just cut ourselves off from there you know there is a impression and i request uh, excellency to to share his views on this that uh, emerging economies and countries in asia are now more keen on globalization than europe and us because they feel that they have lost out on the whole piece of manufacturing and you've seen that uh, coming out of in recent statements from us you know it became a huge issue in the 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 uh, elections the national elections in us even in europe several uh, uh heads of state have talked about the fact that how did we allow uh, the manufacturing of vaccines to go out of europe and why are we not having the same capabilities that other countries have so it seems that you know there is it's not just about what's happening in india and asia but really the economic uh, leaders 
of the world are also uh, retracting in some ways from from the path of uh, globalization. Uh, Prime Minister, would you agree? Yes, some of them are, others are not. But you have to remember, till the 19th century, the big economy was in Asia, China and India. Japan, which was close, but nevertheless big. All that went across. Without us, there could not have been an empire. There could not have been a, the industrial revolution in Europe was basically uh, funded by what went out from India, China and other countries. So you're getting it back. Now you've got to create an Asian market, an African one. Africa population will double. So Asia and Africa has to create that new market. So creating the new market means when the economic power increases, the balances there go. Europeans realize that and went into the European Union. Americans have to adjust to it or come and join the uh, Pacific trading uh, arrangement if they want to stay there. So I think we, we, we are in that situation where Asia should look at globalization, go ahead and create its own market in Asia and reach out to Africa. Australia is also joining this process. Canada will join it. They, they, they require it. So why, why don't we create the new markets through these new arrangements? That's why I also feel India must be a part of it in creating it. Without India, we can't go into the uh, Africa. So that, that's one part. And adding on to what Mr. Mugulan said, I think you also have to look at the structural reforms. Infrastructure, yes, India is starting that, making headway, but economic structural reforms. Because uh, if it can lead to a rise in factor productivity, it's not 5 trillion. You're talking about 8 trillion. So this, this is what it is there. And Peterson Institute says, there's something like 60 billion US uh, can be added on to India's trade if they get into these arrangements. So I think that's that's what you require. To get capital, you also require more trade. And as it expands, there are more investors coming in. Finally, whatever happens, I think the Europeans and the Americans will start investing in India if India is good. That's true. You know, uh, the possibility of an Asian market, uh, uh, how far... Uh, on that curve are we today? Uh, there are structures, but you know, while while there is a lot of argument for RCEP, there is also a, a fear that it is really to create a gated community to benefit only one country, which is China. And therefore, the rules are being set for China, by China, uh, for, and the others have to participate whether they like it or not. So if we have to create a, a strong market within Asia for, for improved trade and investment within the uh, countries, what, what needs to be done now? I think Mr. Mugulan said it, said it clearly. I mean, firstly, there's no question, as I said earlier, we, we need India. We need India. We have ASEAN. ASEAN is a major trading bloc as well. Um, ease of doing business. That, that is so, so, so key. You know, um, right now, the complexities of doing business in India is, is substantial for, for a foreigner and small companies coming in there. It's, it's, they, we need to find ways of easing. Uh, the way we can come in, uh, small, medium-sized enterprises, uh, not so, not, not the mega ones, but you know, companies uh, that are you know, 100, 200, 300 million, uh, they are looking for growth, and the the future is without question Asia. We all know this, but it cannot be, as you suggest, lopsided to China alone. You know, we have a media company as well in our group uh, that makes films and television shows, and by because we have to. Uh, we have um, a production company out of Hong Kong feeding to the Chinese market uh, because, you know, that's, that's that growth market we have. Um, but it should also be into India uh, as we as we go in. So it's not just, it, it's multiple uh, industries, but that ease of doing business is, is critical. And I think that's something India must address. Uh, and if it does, its markets will open up for many of us because we see the size of the market. We see the availability of the market. Question is, how do we get in? How do we do uh, business in India? How do we invest in India when, you know, remember, most, I would say, what, 60% of our GDP in this region is SMEs, minimum, at least. I, I might be wrong, but it'll be around that, right? How do we get that block ease, you know, to, to realize that India is the market that they must get into and then make it comfortable to get into? I mean, they already realize it, but how do we? Um, until then, they are now the supply chain from China becomes the conduit. Why? Because it's always been there, um, and that's what has to change. 
so you know uh, all those uh, uh, audience members who are listening in if you have questions and thoughts please feel free to add it in the comment box i'll try to pick up some and and uh, offer it to the uh, speakers as well and uh, the speakers are also welcome to see the comment and and uh, respond to that in the chat box uh, directly if you like uh, mukund the point about uh, what's happening in asia and in india is also the creation of new models right the western models are not as effective as they used to be perhaps earlier uh, and you know the rise of unicorns in india for example is a great uh, uh, sense it brings a great sense of optimism on on about entrepreneurship in india and the model that that's created around the unicorns is applicable to countries like sri lanka uh, malaysia because you know we have a similar uh, socio economic uh, uh, culture as well at the same time uh, government has also come up with new models like the production linked uh, incentive uh, scheme now do you think that could perhaps address some of the challenges that uh, india faces or the region faces in terms of improving uh, intra region trade and investment see i think a production linked in, in incentive scheme uh, there should be broadly uh, it's it's like viability gap funding you can't look at it beyond that uh but, but it's needed in some sectors it's not needed in all sectors i can just say that uh, we'd rather have uh, better ease of doing business lower cost of doing business than have any incentive in terms of with some production linkages i this, this is my view i i don't need to need to have any support from uh, government except that you make my paperwork less you make uh, you ma- ma- you you reduce the cost of power you reduce the cost of logistics that's really where we are we are today but in some sectors for example if you want to have a local chip manufacturing that's a highly capital intensive business and i think there if if there is if you want to attract capital you need to you need to fundamentally uh, be supporting the companies which come in and there could be one or two of them but i think that because it's a large scale investment it's a huge risk so i i think certainly in some areas especially in electronics i think we need we we have a huge opportunity if if you look at our import bill electronics will be our biggest import bill uh, it's already is and it's going to rise further the hardware import in electronics and if you have to build an alternate industry we need to give incentives and i think government is doing the right thing there is no doubt in my mind but many other sectors we don't need incentive for example look at textile and footwear very large job creating sectors today uh, m- most indian uh, companies uh, mm-hmm. uh, fa- garment manufacturing or footwear they are setting up shop in bangladesh rather than in india and i think we need to reflect what is going on that we do we have the same amount of labor but what is bangladesh done which makes bangladesh a more attractive destination for these high job creating uh, uh, sectors so i think it's all about improving learning and i think it, it there, there is no uh, no shame in learning from a, a country of any size what singapore has done with administration what bangladesh has done with uh, some fast industrialization what sri, sri lanka has done with social equity i think these are all examples i mean you go to sri lanka you find social equity is very high so i think we need to adopt those models some states in india have done it uh, for example the southern states certainly have a higher indicator of so- social equity and that comes from the way uh, southern states and sri lanka have gone about but i think that models have to be taken forward and i want to just add to what datuk said india is not india is a large country so it's got multiple states navigating state level is a big complex problem today i think what governments can do at least the states can step up their effort we need to improve the capability and capacity at the state level to address the economic issues the the bottleneck no longer is at the center i think bottleneck is moved to states now we need i think we must recognize that and i think we must ensure that we can engage at the state level to improve their capacity and capability prime minister you think that uh, government needs to also now think completely out of the box and think of new models because perhaps the policies that were established uh, uh, thanks to bretton woods institutions like world bank and imf uh, you know in the 60s perhaps are not as relevant for our part of the world anymore and therefore the governments need to look at all business and industry oriented policies in a in a fresh way yes i think all of us have think out of the box first is to get out of the mindset we have as far as the bretton wood institutes are concerned i i, I think it has to be uh, there should be more asian participation uh, far more power you if you when you look at the g7 meetings you you wonder how much are they relevant to all of us you have germany others canada standing out but the work is been done here in this part of the world so let's let's think out of the box 
and think on new ways. Uh, first is how to eliminate a lot of the bureaucratic nature. And you can put part of the bureaucracy back into the social security sector. Remove it out of the uh, economic sector. Then I think digitalization, those, those, you have to think anew as to how we're going to push those in. It's worthwhile even subsidizing people to use that technology in the first round, where you, you're only creating a market. Secondly, uh, you've got to think out of the box because uh, if you look at China, there was the question of the China should think uh, within the box or outside. Deng Xiaoping wanted it to go outside. Chen Yong wanted it to be inside the box. So you had a bird. If he had been there, there would have been a bird cage economy. So they would have not grown up that much. So we, we have to take uh, l- learn from them. How, how do you go ahead? Now, I've been talking Africa because we are in Africa now, uh, the Chinese are funding a railway which will grow from uh, Tanzania all the way to Congo. The second railway which comes from Djibouti down to Ethiopia and can go further down. So they have, they've already penetrated. India has started one through Iran, but that has to be developed further. So you've got to look at uh, uh, Africa, at least the East Africa, as a part of the market. India should look at the whole of Africa that China is doing. So we, we've got to take the mindset. That's why I say India must join these groupings and finally bring Africa in. That, that's how you can have to set the economic grouping, the geopolitics of it, and then allow the private sector all, all the uh, if, uh, all the support to go ahead and open up. It has to be private initiative. It cannot be the state sector. No, that's a great idea, you know, and, and uh, talking of a new model, I think you presented a very interesting thought here and I'll request Dathuk to comment on that, that can countries like Sri Lanka, Malaysia, India work together uh, for, for, uh, uh, with, with African countries? In, you know, that's the, is that a possibility? You know, there's absolute possibility. I mean, look, it, it's happened before. We had South-South arrangements uh, a while ago, uh, a long while ago. Um, while that didn't, uh, it, it, it didn't move as aggressively as it could have, because I don't think Africa was ready at that time. Uh, I believe right now Africa is ready. I mean, if you look at the growth in, in countries like Nigeria, uh, South Africa, uh, Botswana, um, Ghana, um, the opportunities that, of course, there are some other African countries that we cannot get into, right? It's, uh, it's, uh, unstable and, uh, there are many issues. Um, but when you, when you look at purely perspective of some, some of the growth that's occurring in Africa, India, Sri Lanka, uh, Bangladesh, Malaysia. Kundan, you can hear me? Yes. Sorry. You disappeared for a while. <laughs> You're back now. <laughs> sorry. I think there was an interruption. So please continue that. Yes. Um, so I think, you know, these countries are, are rife for collaboration with um, countries like Sri Lanka and Malaysia and, and Bangladesh and India um, to take advantage. Don't forget, Malaysia is, you know, at least about seven, eight percent of our population identify themselves as Indian of Indian ancestry. And if you look at the real Indian ancestry of Malaysia, the numbers are probably about 25 percent, 30 percent. Uh, in real terms of, of, of connection to India. So there is there is this uh, ability for us both culturally uh, and economically to work together. And Africa is an absolute market that has not been fully tapped yet. We've allowed China to tap it. Why? <laughs> so why are we allowing China to take charge of the African narrative? Why has an India? And India can lead us. India can go forward, take along with it Sri Lanka, Malaysia and others and go, go into uh, uh, Africa and African economies and actually play a significant role. That, that will be significantly mutually beneficial because that market is growing and is growing by the day. And people get sometimes scared off or people get confused. Firstly, Africa is a very big continent. And of course, there are the hotspots that we would not go anywhere near. But that doesn't change the fact that the other countries that are growing and that are expanding are there for a stake uh, and be part of. No, that's 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 a good point, and I think people must understand that when when we collectively look at the continent, uh, fifty five countries, and each region has its own specific dynamics and needs. And and uh, uh, Excellency talked about the investment in railways and logistics, which are fundamentals. And I think there is no reason why uh, countries, uh, companies from from uh, our countries, cannot participate. I mean, from Malaysia, several infrastructure companies are doing good uh, work in India, especially in in uh, urban transportation, for instance. So, uh, do you think that's something that uh, India should look at? Because we are only talking about 
globalization and uh, self reliance there is a regionalization also which is which is critical uh, for us to bind together actually i am so delighted that i think we have converged on one issue which i think is uh, probably one of the things cia has been projecting for a long long time and this is about building powerful regional web of networks and i think it's extremely important you can't globalize without re- regional networks operating in a very efficient way i think we went with lot of uh, positive enthusiasm but uh, uh, you know uh, uh, linking with asean linking with uh, uh, this uh, you know bimstech and then also building that uh, linkages with japan korea i think we must display that make it more vibrant to look look there and say what's worked what's not worked i think a- every one of these blocks are willing to uh, look through things which can improve uh, parity on both sides as far as coming to africa is concerned i think one of the big benefits india has is a huge diaspora in africa whether we like it or not there's a large diaspora there there's a, there's a cultural affinity to india if you look at let's take an example of tanzania their entire schooling system initially was run by indian school teachers you go there there's they almost uh, sort of uh, have a strong liking to india similar is the situation in most countries i think uh, leave the hot spots as datu ka said uh, africa remains a, a point of opportunity uh, it's it's a large continent but we can't go there alone we need partners and the partnerships can be from the regional network and uh, take the best of the breed and move forward and certainly the conversation in africa is very similar uh, pranjal if you look at the conversation in africa uh, uh, they don't want uh, one country to monopolize the infrastructure they want another country to come in and sort of play the balance role and i really they look forward to india and india's participation the government of india has made some positive moves in terms of uh, allocating greater amount of funds for uh, these uh, projects in africa but i think we must have if 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 it comes to capital as a shortage i think we must look at regional networks to increase the capital uh, required and multiply that with the regional power and then move forward Uh, Mukund, since you refer to uh, CII, and let me ask you: Are there models or examples uh, where uh, maybe companies from your group uh, or from India would have collaborated with other countries in Asia uh, to in Africa? Are there any examples yet, or do you think that's still yet to fall into place? I think specifically, we need to build those models. I think we haven't fully exploited and thought through this, but this is a very interesting idea which both. Uh, uh, excellency prime minister and uh, datu ka highlighted and i think i fully agree with them i think this is an unexplored area there certainly was a conversation with the the uh, us aid at some point of time wherein they said that uh, you know they, they need people to go down there the human resource in india coupled with the capital resource coming from us could be the right way to address the development needs in africa but i think what we are now discussing is the region coming together to build a greater market which which has similar needs i think that's really the uh, concept and i think it it's something which we should uh, engage in and i think government uh, of india would also be very positively inclined because they see their role also to increasingly increase increase the footprint in africa in many ways excellency you brought such a wonderful positive constructive idea to uh, to this discussion and i'm sure that's going to be a great takeaway uh, from this session but you think government of sri lanka and other such governments would also like to explore such models Yes, certainly. I, I think government should uh, explore this. And remember that from South Africa to uh, Singapore, in around the Indian Ocean, about eighteen or seventeen countries belong to the Commonwealth. Same education system. We all play cricket except for Malaysia. No, we play cricket. Don't play cricket from us. We just don't play cricket at all right now. But we do play cricket. <laughs> okay. So we can get along. And I, while I mean, I think a lot of things we can be doing. I. I Since Mugunda is here, and you all, I want to give an example that we we have sent a, a army into peacekeeping in Mali, and a few people got uh, blown up. So we built a new uh, armored troop carrier. They have basically taken the Tata base, and the army has put in a new system, and some engineers came and added the technology. It's called Avalon. So that's that's how we can all uh, work together. So there are so many possible that we work together and go out there, but. Africa must be got at because that's the market that is that will grow. You can see East East Asia is growing. That market is settled to a certain extent. You have some more scope within ASEAN, and uh, beyond that, it has to be Africa. We go outside South Asia; it has to be Africa. So we we have to let Africa and going there. 
you know we have uh, less than 5 minutes left just about 5 minutes left so i'm going to take this one final question to to all of you uh, in this issue and and objective of uh, bringing the region more tightly closer uh, with economic linkages who should who can drive it do you think that that the new unicorns and new uh, young smart startups which are uh, driving growth from uh, technology platforms can can create a larger market beyond uh, their own countries because uh, i was in in sri lanka and colombo you know couple of years ago excellency and i noticed there's a very vibrant startup environment and the same is in uh, malaysia as well so that could be one dynamo that could bring the region together uh, you know larger companies uh, that that are present in this uh, could could do that or of course the government so uh, my my quick uh, response i would request a quick response from all of you is which of these three pillars of of the economy do you think uh, can perhaps uh, be the best place to do it so uh, excellency i'll i'll request you and then dato can then mukund then to respond i i think follow the precedent what what happened earlier large numbers of uh, people from our subcontinent went out to africa and started there and they built up empires so since the unicorns and the other uh, people would like to go in there and the bigger companies would like to get in and then the governments back them up I, i don't think there's other way there be a large number of people who look, go there looking for new opportunities that's how people from this part of the world have been going into africa and i think you, you could uh, let them do that maybe government should back them up with some form of a safety net or provide some uh, credit which which which, which will help that, that i think that that's what has to be done but your thoughts okay i i think uh, we, we shouldn't get carried with unicorns i mean i know that's the new hip thing and, and it's a nice word um you know <laughs> startups are, are critical and important but i mean we get carried away with unicorns and uh, you know generally unicorns don't tend to create uh, sustainable wealth uh that flows down and takes care of others so we have to be cognizant that we need that because that's innovation that's growth and that's what we can export and we can bring to other countries and develop together but then you need to balance it out with the likes of tata chemicals and the large companies that move forward uh it's it's as as the his excellency said it it's got to be that combination of, of groups going in um that that um, both that um, naive optimism uh that's required for for new ideas and new innovations to come to life so that you know people take chances they don't they don't normally take because that's what that's what's required right when you're when you're entering a new new fertile soil you take chances you 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 do things that maybe others don't do and that's where the great new businesses emerge uh, but it needs to be backed by bigger companies going forward and doing the same um but i think as was mentioned again by the prime minister um governments must ease the flow you know the governments must play a role in opening the door uh you know liaising with the other governments and making it easier for companies like all of us to go in and do business uh and that is a critical role the governments must play um because without that it becomes a struggle so with that you can actually see a lot of opportunities it becomes a two way highway uh with very few uh, tolls <laughs> on the way and and then you get innovation and growth and then some of the unicorns might actually um uh come to fruition and uh and uh, uh bigger companies uh, create a sustainable industrial uh anchor uh that allows other growth to go around it so it's a combination that has to happen but governments must play a very key role in in ensuring that highway is built to allow us to uh thank so mukund the last word with you uh, thanks pranjal i don't know my screen is blank I, i i don't know whether i'm audible yes we can see you and hear you oh, please okay. continue we just yeah, have we just have about a minute to close yeah, I, i think uh, what, what prime minister said and datuk said i fully agree with what they've said in terms of we need a balance uh, the point about there is a need to take risk i think uh, we we should not be risk averse we should take some risk and there will be some positives and there could be few failures i think fundamentally i think we need to uh, move forward in this direction and st- start to think about atmanirbhar which is self dependent or self reliance as not uh, as an e- separate thing but it's part of globalization we become strong internally then to partner externally to be uh, playing a greater role in the uh, global ambitions and global networks i think that's the way i look at it i don't think they they what we looked at it at two two different uh, ends of the pole but they fundamentally work 
together in unison. If we're weak internally, I think we will never be able to play any role in the global world. I think uh, that the concept of Atmanirbhar has to be viewed in that perspective. And uh, fully agree with what Prime Minister has said. Uh, India must play the role. India must take the lead forward and engage more. Thank you. And with this, I'd like to close the session. Thank you very much to all of you who joined and especially to the speakers, Excellency Datuk and Mukundan for being, uh, uh, you know, so, so candid and so vibrant uh, in this discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat>